Hello. Hello, friends. This is Rami. I can't remember if we introduced him last week. He was singing before, so I figured he'd want to be on screen. Even though he's usually very camera shy. It's true. Right now he's purring. Maybe he can tell when other people are watching. You can certainly tell when I'm trying to take a picture of him. Mm -hmm. This is true facts. Hello. Ah. This is Remy J. Foucault. I forget if we decided what the J stood for. Nothing. Yeah, it's just J. He's like Homer J. Simpson. His last name is Foucault because we got him while I was in grad school. Or was it just after? It was after grad school. It was school. well after grad school. Yeah, but I was still in that grad school frame of mind. So we have a cat whose last name is Foucault. They told me that the reason that they wanted to name a cat Foucault is so they could make jokes about deconstructing the couch when the cat was scratching at it. That's what it was. And they have yet to make that joke. <laughs> I made that joke several <laughs> times. Back when Remy was crawling into the couch on a regular basis. Yes, <laughs> Remy Jemmy Foucault, done. Thank you for completing our cat's name. Ta-da. We're here, we're back in the kitchen. We made it through another week. Oh, I think that's fine. That's fine by me if you guys play. Well, you can't see the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We'll pet him again for you. He has fled. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. It's in the bottom of the hutch. Krista just pet Remy for you. That's been done. Hi, folks. I hope your week has been good, or at least, you know, you've made it through, so that's that counts. I hope everything is going as well as it possibly can be, given all the givens. And since last week we didn't know what we were doing with the whole software thing, uh, this week we're back in the kitchen and uh, we're baking again, but we're gonna try and bake some savory stuff this time. I should probably plug the computer in, you know, since it has the battery life of a sneeze. It has plenty of battery life. You just need to actually plug it in to recharge it. Yeah, it would help if I remembered to recharge my things. Yeah, nope, maybe. <sighs> as we calibrate our live stream. Yeah, I think that's good. All right. Shout out, if you can't hear us or if the audio is weird at all, we don't have the microphone plugged in. We're trying some different things. Oh, well, today we have pretzel rolls and challah bread. And challah is something that uh, I have a lot of nostalgia for. So I can't wait to make some. Oh. That's a good question. We do have this whole wheat flour, which is what is you often meant by bread flour. So, yeah. I mean, it's not quite the same thing, but it's similar, right? We'll see. I don't think so. No? Whole wheat flour is just whole wheat flour. Okay. <laughs> I think it'll be fine. You have to we get do, inventive with your baking. We do have a little bit more whole wheat flour out there. Okay. Good. Everybody's not allowed on the counter. But he knows that he's not allowed on the counter. And so, here, this set is from you. I didn't want y'all to think that we just let them jump up onto the counter. <laughs> Red flour is just high gluten. Hey, there's, yeah. Yeah, I think that sounds right. And that would be good for pretzels, right? Pretzel rolls should be uh, glutinous. Sure. Yes. So yeah, I think, do we have a rise time for the pretzel rolls? Uh, do they rise? Do they do? An hour. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. The holla rise time is longer. It's, um, yeah, it's 60 to 90 minutes. So how about we start with the holla? Okay. All right, I'm gonna wash my hands now that I've thoroughly pet the cat. <sighs> Yeah, they're saying red flower is cyclone, not yeah. that holy flower is cyclone. Oh. Oh. Well, I don't know. Because you used the whole wheat flour to make the milk bread the first time. I did, and, and it was dense and weighted down a lot. Right, because it it's for whole wheat bread. <laughs> I mean, it's what we have. <laughs> yes. So let's bake with it. I'm just saying, it's not the same thing, but it's what we have. Yeah. We'll see. Um, I got a friend over at King Arthur Flower, which is in our state after all. Uh, well, friend of a friend. And hopefully we can get just a whole bunch more flour in. Because it's always nice when you know someone in the place where they're selling it by the 25 pound bag, right? That should do. Okay. First thing we need for challah bread, challah is uh, warm water, 105 to 115. It's nice to have a kettle. Kettle's going to heat up. And then half a cup of honey. I don't like to bake with the nice honey that we get from our local beekeepers because I want to save that for just eating straight out of the jar, frankly. So I have this cheap-ass honey that's from the grocery store, which is why I pronounce it like that. And uh, to get a half a cup out of this, I think I'm going to have to run it under hot water, probably, and just like re-liquidize it a little bit because it's um it's pretty solid as honey goes. I wonder if you could just microwave it. Maybe. Or not the plastic. Yeah, that's the trouble with that. Oh. Yeah, if you've watched any bee documentaries in the last like 10 years, <laughs> you you probably know that a lot of mass market honey tends to be mostly, if not entirely, corn syrup. But look, it tastes good. It does the same thing. Who yeah. cares? It'll probably act similarly in baking. Yeah. I mean, it, it does. does. We know it does, because yeah. that's what we use it for. Could you get the liquid measure out, the plunger measure? Plunger measure, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean. The, measure the plunger the measure. Plunger. The plunger measure. For sticky things. Extremely important for honey. What do we have? Uh, half a cup. Good. Now it's time to extract honey with a knife. Recently started buying beekeeper honey and you really can taste the difference. Right? Yeah. The first year that I had a beehive, God, so long ago now, <laughs> uh, was the year that the bees really went after the raspberries and you could just taste the raspberry in that honey. Oh, you could taste it a lot. It was great. I loved it so much. And then they caught the peaches, I think, the year after that. And yeah. you could taste that too. And the year after that, I think it was very briefly blueberry, but then I needed to treat for mites. And you should not eat honey from a beehive uh, when you're treating it with a uh, mild insecticide to kill the mites. That's just, it's not a good idea. So what we have from that hive is like half a cup, half a jar of uh, honey that is only to be used in ritual and magic purposes and not to be used for eating. And someday we'll have hives again. I think if not this year, then I mean, this year's kind of bad for all sorts of projects, mm -hmm. but maybe next year I can just ask around in town and see who in town has some space to put a hive up. Because the real problem with me for beekeeping was that it was, the hives were an hour away up a mountain in bear country. We're still in bear country. <laughs> we're not in bear country like that mountain is bear country, though. We're not in bear comes up to your back porch and chills for a while, bear country. There's just fewer bears down We're in the valley. It makes the news when a bear chills on a back porch in Brattleboro. Sure. It doesn't happen every other week. I grew up in the 
grew up in Bear Country anyway, and that was in the suburbs of New Jersey. Yeah, and did they come to your door? Not my door specifically. Yeah. One of them tried to merge onto the parkway. Oh, sure. <laughs> no, it climbed up a, a tree next to a parkway overpass. Yeah. Oops. I just pushed down on the plunger. That's no good. Pull it back to a half cup. There we go. Do you have a bowl that this is for anything? Uh, we should, but we don't at this moment. A large bowl, it says. A large bowl. Yeah. A large bowl that is going to foam yeast, so not the metal one. Plastic? Plastic's fine. For some reason, aluminum uh, React. reacts with yeast, or so I am told, in ways that... That's the sort of thing that I'm told that, and it intuitively makes sense to me, and then I'm not sure if it's real. I don't know. Here's a real organic traffic line. There was that one in Vermont who crossed in front of us during a dark night, and that was not a crosswalk. Well, there are no crosswalks up there. That's true. That's true. You gotta cross where you can. That's not the bear's fault. Alrighty. Plunged. And now there's just chunks of sugar everywhere. How are y'all doing, friends? How was your week? I'm gonna put water and yeast in here. We're trying not to feed the ants. Yes. <laughs> Since they started uh, coming to visit. That time of year. I've made bread in plastic bowls and in my parents' mixer with metal bowls, and I haven't noticed a difference. The mixer bowl is treated. This I remember because uh, mixers specifically have like a dough hook, so they're supposed to be used with bread. But some metal bowls do weird crap. Yeah, I was right at the bottom of the mountain, and one time a family of bears came and got into our bird feeder. Ooh. <laughs> That sounds like a fun day. <laughs> the recipe says two packages of yeast, but our package of yeast is this. So I'm just gonna like, guess? Well, how much is in a regular? I have no yeah. idea. How much in one package? Or I can just put a, a tablespoon in. Make two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. Okay, so a little under a tablespoon. I was close. I'm just gonna underfill this tablespoon and call it a day because it's yeast. It's fine. There we go. Now this needs uh, one and three quarter cups of water out the kettle. I have, yeah. I have had this same pack of yeast in a Tupperware in my fridge for ages. Sorry, was that a yes we have the measuring cups over here? It's there over there by the, yeah. I've had the same big package of yeast for ages. It's probably expired, but it still works. Uh, one and three quarter cups into this big bowl to wake up the yeast. Just spray it in? Yeah. Three quarters. Another time, a young bear came to the bird feeder. It just sat on our porch railing and licked seeds off of it for a while. <laughs> That's amazing. Right, because like the seeds on a bird feeder oftentimes are stuck to it with sugar, right? Or some sort of honey, stuff. peanut butter. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Seeds and sugar. It's like a granola bar. Maybe this needs to be whisked to break up that honey. I think the whisk is good. It is. I made waffles this morning, so a lot of our baking stuff is dry. That's very charitable. Charitable of you to call it morning. Oh yeah, it was really lunch. Morning lasts until two p.m., as you know. 
When I hear bird feeder stories, animals getting into bird feeder stories, I always think of the place in Massachusetts where we learned archery. We did a weekend archery course uh, down at a, a nice little spot in Massachusetts. Uh, someone's house. Very nice. Oh, a nice big chunk of property. A very cool couple with like a dozen different kinds of chicken. And they had bird feeders strung between trees on lines and in the middle of the line there would be a bird feeder like a clothesline and then on either side there were large clear water bottles filled with water and like punctured through with the line and then sealed up so that water wouldn't leak out and these water bottles or soda bottles uh were just hung on either side of the line and it took a while of both staring at that and asking questions to realize that these were meant to be an obstacle course so that squirrels that tried to get to the bird feeder would fall off the spinning water bottles on their way. Yeah, it was great. It was also like just a great piece of yard art because the light reflected off the liquid in great ways. God, it was a great house, a great space. Okay. Let's stand 10 minutes or until foamy. That gets 10 minutes. In the meantime, it's time to lightly beat four eggs. <laughs> Would you beat some eggs? Yes. Four? Yeah. Can you grab the composter? Okay. Can you open it? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Reading chat. Wait, you have pictures of the bear licking the seeds off of your bird feeder because that's wonderful. That's delightful. I wish our bears were that chill. They come up to the beehives and leave inch deep gouges in the wood. Well, sure. That is not chill. <laughs> that is that is the opposite of I'm chill. Being attacked, though. Sure. There's conflict involved in and a like, bear visit. It's not, I, I doubt that it was like, oh, I'm going to attack this beehive. It was more just they happen to have claws, and it's the easiest thing to use to open up the. Yeah. You said before, we've just got black bears up here. Black bears are fine. They don't care. Like, they care if, you, if you're, like, threatening them, but... What's really not chill is the aftermath. When I come to the beehive and the bees think I am a bear. <laughs> bear country can be fun, though. <laughs> I mean, I understand. I used to live in armadillo country, which is much calmer. <laughs> Aside from the fact that they're, you know, shin high and can be punted like a soccer ball at need. They're just very beautiful, shy, fey creatures. It's the moose that you have to watch out for. As if we have so ever we seen hear. a moose. Yeah. There was one running through the backyards on our block apparently a few years back. But of course it was early in the morning and we were asleep and we can't see the backyard. <laughs> we miss it. Moose are like armadillos. They're fairy creatures who appear at sunrise. I, I wouldn't call the them sunrise. fairies. Huh? I wouldn't call them fairies. Moose are the biggest fairies. We have jackals. <gasps> wild animals and you shouldn't pet them but they look almost exactly like dogs and i'm always incredibly tempted to pet them i would be too <laughs> pups. Pup, pup, pup. okay the eggs yes are waiting for the uh yeast mixture to foam up and so now we just need to put in Eight cups of bread flour, <laughs> which might just be this whole dang thing. 
So we have a cup measure that's clean. Probably in the thing. Yeah. I just think that so this is the challah bread uh, recipe from the Better Homes and Gardens new cookbook, which is cheesy, but you know, <laughs> they have a lot of good basic information in there. Like, here is a cut of meat. How long should you cook it and at what temperature? This thing is our bread and butter cookbook in the kitchen. Cause you know, sometimes you go to a cookbook and it's like, how do I make this one specific, very complicated dish? But sometimes you just want to know how long to put meat in the oven for, or how many eggs go in challah. There's also a lot of like conversions. Useful reference. Yeah. We need one more bowl for this. What do we need to do to start the pretzels? Uh, mix and knead the no ingredients. Ah, okay. So we could use the um, mixer bowl for that. So we will need to wash that from its egg white state. Okay, you want to measure cups or wash a bowl? I'll measure. Yay. Seven and a half cups. Okay. There's so many clumps in this. A while. Yeah. One. Can you really just dump this out into the bowl and then use the measuring cup and dump it into another bowl? If that would be easiest. It would actually be easiest. Okay, then. <laughs> Instead of have another bowl. <laughs> We're just going to use go. every single bowl in the house, too. That's what baking is. Yeah, I mean, the eggs here can go into the bowl. Luckily, we have a decent amount of large bowls. I think your brother gave us mixing bowls as a Christmas gift at least twice, and trust me, I'm uh, not. I'm not complaining at all. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, there were these, and then there was the plastic. Yeah. All right. Here you go. Thank you. One. <laughs> Two. Three. I'm sorry for the smacking against the glass. <laughs> Five. Six. Oh, yeah, we don't have a scale here. We keep meaning to get one. Yeah. Seven. Seven and a half? Seven and a half. We have scales back at work. <laughs> Dipping scales. Though that's basically a baking scale, right? Yeah. Though I think a baking scale needs to be slightly more exact. Yeah, the problem is that... Um, the, we have a, a digital one and a, a an analog one, and the digital one is really just meant to measure 
overweight envelopes. Um, Very so small. It, it, yeah, I forgot what the weight limit is, but it freaks out once you get a little too heavy. And then the big one is, it goes up to, I think, 30 pounds. And so it's not very good for smaller. <laughs> it's got like one of those waggling needles that yeah. points at a dial of numbers. And when you're trying to measure out for baking. Eh, I have doubts <laughs> about that one. All right, here's the butter for the pretzel stuff. But there is a mid-size uh, Wait, at the uh, our local Ace Hardware. That's true. We should that actually get we, that. Said we were going to pick up, but then we didn't. One of these days. And now the yeast mixture is foamy. I don't know if you can see the foam, but it is there. Yeah. Yay. Foamy yeast. Using a wooden spoon specifically, stir in. Four eggs, melted butter, and the salt. Well, here's the four eggs. And then put the four eggs in first so that they get diluted with other things before the hot melted butter goes in because I have cooked eggs in a batter with hot melted butter before. It's bad. <laughs> I never want to do it again. I'm going to need a tablespoon of that nice fine salt. We still have the tablespoons uh, left of it. It's over there by the uh, tissues. Okay. Yes. The butter is indeed for the challah. Um, I don't know what to tell you. That's what the recipe says. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. It's tablespoon. Tablespoon. It's on the counter. Paula is made with oil, water, and dairy. Sure, I could use oil, but we have butter. Butter is oil. And butter is also dairy. Oh, butter is made with oil, never dairy. Gotcha. Okay, that's legit. But we have butter. <laughs> yeah, I could. I could absolutely use oil with this. And maybe I will next time. Right now I'm just following the Better Homes and Gardens new cookbook, which I'm now that you mention it. go on record to say that this is the most nutritious cookbook. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yes, please. One tablespoon. The recipe is wrong. Yes. I believe you. I believe, I totally believe that this recipe is wrong. It made a very good chocolate and coffee hala last time. So I'm trying again this time. And, and you know what, where's the pencil? This is one of the nice things about having your own cookbook is that you can mark it up. I'm gonna mark it and be like, try oil next time. I wish I could have a vote of confidence in here, but I grew up in such a Catholic town that we were able to, uh, uh, we, we we had two Catholic schools, so I've never actually had a law before. Remy, you're still not allowed on the counter. Yeah, but my hands are dirty, so my hands are clean, rather, so I should not pet the noodle. This is the noodle. And he's still not allowed up here. He yeah. just wants attention. So yeah. much attention. Negative says, I'm Jewish and I grew up religious. I have made a lot of challah. I... <laughs> awesome. Am I saying your name right? Is Negev how I should say, how, sh how I should be saying that? Screen names and pronunciations. Let me know. Next thing says, gradually stir in as much of the flour as can be stirred before it ceases to be a stirrable thing and becomes a dough. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I've got it noted. Excellent. I've got it noted to try oil next time and see what that does and how it feels. I grew up a religious, but in a 
Texan household that firmly believe that uh, butter is a food group. I'm one of those Southerners uh, who sort of butter and bacon were just the standard things that you always cooked with for everything. And if you don't have any bacon fat, well, you fry up a pound of bacon and you save the meat for later and you pour off the fat and you use it to cook whatever you were going to cook. Like, that's where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have anything like a, a heritage to back that up, really, <laughs> because what I have is my mother from Kentucky farm country where there were just pig farms everywhere. And so bacon was. I mean, that's the heritage. Yeah. The South. yeah. <laughs> well, the South is, is a really weird thing to talk about as heritage. And also, I feel really weird a lot of the times claiming the South as heritage because I come from Austin, Texas which is this weird liberal enclave in the middle of Texas. And I grew up during a tech boom where everyone was moving and everything was changing. So if I have a cultural heritage, it's hard to pin it down. There are a lot of things that when we've talked about our respective childhoods, that the, some of the differences are very distinctly between the North and the South. <laughs> this is true. Bacon exactly once. It was fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bacon got like a a legendary overblown status just because of the whole man cave culture. I think it I think it gets rolled yeah. into that. Yeah, it really does. It's fine. It's food. <laughs> yeah. I have eaten legendary bacon once. Like bacon that was amazing, that was the best possible bacon ever. And uh, this is actually a story. Um, what? Eli's gonna tell a story now. This never <laughs> happens on this stream. So when I went to Japan after college, I was a jet. I did the Japan Exchange teaching program. So uh, I was teaching English in a rural town uh, in the mountains on the coast, south of major cities for a while there. And there's a set of questions that uh, are standard to ask foreigners in Japan. And one of them is, you know, like there's a set of questions that are standard to ask foreigners in America. Uh, and in Japan, some of those questions are like, how do you like it here? What's your favorite Japanese food? Is it sushi or is it something else? Because they're used to everyone answering sushi. Uh, or uh, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? Um, almost always the heteronormative version of that question, though delightfully once not. Uh, and weirdly, one of the questions that kids asked me in almost every school I went to, they asked, what do you miss in American food? And I got that question a lot in the general Q&A of ask your token foreigner in the classroom anything. Uh, what do you miss in American food? And the first couple of times I had like no answer because there was a supermarket there. It had basically everything. I was fine. I was having a lot of fun trying out recipes on packages of food and I could eat all of the fresh fish I wanted because we were on the coast and the supermarket bought from the coastal fishermen and it was so good. Like I didn't miss shit. <laughs> Austin is five hours drive away from a coast. I mean, you can, but it's not generally a great choice. But eventually like a month in when, you know, culture shock hit and I was like, all right, what's something that would make me feel more at home? I did say bacon because to me, bacon is like butter. It's something that you cook with and it's something that's just there. And it wasn't, there was nothing. Um, the, in the meat section, they had things that were marked bacon, but it was not bacon, it was pork belly. It was just uncured, straight, part of the pig, pork belly, which is fine. I certainly made ramen with it and it was great, but it wasn't bacon. So I started to say that. I started to say, you know, I miss bacon. I miss real bacon. I know you think you have bacon in the grocery stores because it says bacon on it, but it's not what I think of as bacon. And so that would actually like start a conversation and people would be interested and we'd talk about pig farms and curing and curing meats in general. And uh, that would occasion interesting conversations from different people at different times. And one day, one of my 
co-English teachers because I was there as an assistant to the regular English teachers. And one of my co-English teachers, who was kind of a gross dude who I didn't like <laughs> for a lot of reasons, um, brought me an apology gift because he had pissed me off and he knew it. <laughs> He'd, uh, I mean, we pissed each other off. I had corrected his English one too many times in class. And uh, he... Yeah, yeah, but I was like 22 and he was like 40 and I was being a little shit about it. And he wasn't <laughs> learning anything. And, and his students were getting better at English than at him because of me. And he was feeling like really bad about that. And he took it out on me. Anyways, yeah, I don't think that's okay. we'd, but, you know. we'd had a teacher fight <laughs> and he brought me an apology gift. And he, it was actually like at the end of the school year, because it was around the time of my birthday. And he knew my birthday, because that's one of the questions that everyone asks is, when's your birthday? And the apology gift was a quarter pound of really good bacon that he had mail ordered from a specialty farm in Hokkaido. Well, like, right, because if you're going to, if you're going to mail order bacon, <laughs> it better be worth it. It was. It was just a quarter pound, so it was like what six thick cut slices, and I I took and it was you know I could tell it was precious. You can tell from the packaging when these things are precious, and I uh, took one slice and I chopped it up real fine and just fried it up like that and tasted it. Oh, oh, it was really good. I didn't like that guy, but after that I couldn't hate him. <laughs> Because he made me feel better at a point when I was homesick and it was my birthday and we just had a really like bad fight and he and I had like started to doubt my my fitness as a teacher or my ability to relate to other human beings or adults in a professional capacity because Which is silly because he was a great teacher. I mean, but I was twenty two and, and like, I, what did I help? as somebody who has had teachers who people claim were good teachers, but you know, they only claim that because the teachers were smart. And it's like, there's a difference between being smart and being a good teacher. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had been feeling really bad that time. Okay, a quarter pound of bacon is a small amount of bacon when you consider that a normal package is a pound. Not like a serving. Yeah, it's just a, what comes in a normal package of bacon. Yeah, like normally you, you buy it in a pound because you're using it over several different meals. Um, a quarter pound of bacon is like, again, maybe six thick cut slices. And I would say I would normally have two to three slices in any given meal that includes bacon. Maybe more depending how bacon heavy the dish is, but not really like for an individual serving. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a small amount to come in a package. It's like, it's like saying a half a cup of flour. Like, a half a cup of flour is not really a small amount when you're, I don't know, uh, in a recipe, but it's a small amount to buy. <laughs> but also, that sounds like it probably would have been prohibitively expensive if they package the whole pound yeah yeah i didn't i don't know how much it was and i didn't ask but it came mail order from a specialty farm and it had like uh it some, said on the package something like you know aged three months and like it was oh uh, i actually don't know how much is a standard aging time for bacon so i don't know if that's a lot or not but oh uh, the the generic stuff and like the turkey hill the hormel mm -hmm. they probably cut some corners and just yeah age it for as long as they absolutely positively have to yeah chemically too okay oh you've been tagged on twitter with pictures of the bear yay thank you Negev said something really nice. Thank you. I can't read it out loud. It's nice things about me. <laughs> Thank you. They're confirming that Eli is probably a very good teacher based on being engaging <laughs> during live stream. Which, yeah, 
That's exactly it. I tell you what, if teaching is nothing but telling stories, I'm in. It's sharing the knowledge that you know. Yeah. And that's part of what telling stories is. Yeah. Anyway, that's the story of the really mind blowing bacon I had once. <sighs> Yeah. Okay, so this is time to knead. You want to stir together ingredients in there for the pretzel dough? Sure. Big memories from Discovery Channel to me they age it for like a week or two, but that might have been sausage, not bacon. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine that there's, well, it depends on the sausage also. Yeah. It's like Italian sausage isn't aged at all. Wait, really? Yeah, it's just raw. Huh. That's why you have to cook it. Oh, I mean, but like kielbasa's, kielbasa is aged. Okay. Um, and like <clears throat> salami and pepperoni, that kind of lunch meat is aged. It's time to put my ring in a place where it won't get into the bread dough. <sighs> You know how they always say turn out the dough on a lightly floured surface? I always forget to do that. So I've turned out the dough and then it sticks to the surface. And then I put flour next to it and sort of rub it around. And it eventually makes sense. It says, knead in enough of the remaining flour to make a moderately soft dough that is smooth and elastic. Knead for five to seven minutes. Okay, so at 457, I may have a smooth and elastic dough, we'll see. I usually knead with the professor, which is our stand mixer, but today I'm kneading by hand, kneading a hollow by hand so the pretzel rolls can go into the stand mixer because I feel like it and I feel like having two breads at once. This is all just flour in here, right? Yes, that's all the whole wheat flour. Yay. <sighs> I don't know if y'all can hear Remy singing from the floor, but Remy is here and singing. Singing his sad song that there are no humans to pit him. And getting on the counter for a third time today. Dude really wants some attention. Meanwhile, Minerva is just sitting in the window staring at the mail truck. At least they're not trying to attack it. Minerva is the cat that tries to attack things outside the window. Last night, and this is new for this cat, I have a new story about Minerva, our murder <laughs> cat, which is that uh, we have a cat tower. It's got like five levels on it. And that's, <laughs> and the cat tower is where Minerva sleeps most of the time. And sometimes Remy gets to be on it, but not all the time, because Minerva's the mean cat. Um, and last night, Minerva, Aggressive? No. <laughs> Dominant is also the wrong word. Uh, protective, grumpy. Are More, the older siblings? <laughs> yes. We have two cats. Remy and Minerva are the two cats that we have. And last night, Minerva was up on the cat tower sleeping, like very clearly curled up, face planted down, and they started to growl. And we have heard Minerva growl plenty of times before because when there's an asshole cat outside the window or when there's a skunk or when there's a bird sometimes, when there's something out there, Minerva will make this like low, angry sound that's like they're really, really gonna beat the crap out of something right away. I was and gonna say, it was like, it was a growl, but it wasn't like a serious growl. It was just kind of... Which was also weird, because usually when they're growling, they're pretty serious about it. And yes, they are named Minerva because they have McGonagall markings. They're a tabby cat. And uh, they, they look like they could jump forward and turn into a grumpy professor at any moment. That is the origin of Minerva's name, well spotted. And um, I need some. So they growl and we look up and they're twitching with their paws in the air. And we both realize at the same time, I think, that they're asleep 
and growling at an enemy in their sleep. And this is the first time this has happened that Minerva is dreaming of asshole cats outside the window or skunks coming back in like they do. It's they're May. More than like just while they're dreaming. Yeah, yeah. They were they were yelling in their sleep. It's great. It was hilarious once we realized that they were not about to turn around and shred Remy's ear again. Minerva does that displacement thing that cats do sometimes when they see an enemy outside the window and Remy's too close to them, they will turn around and attack Remy. And it really sucks because 99% of the time they love each other and they cuddle and they lick each other and everything's fine. And then sometimes Minerva doesn't recognize Remy. Kind of hate it. But yes, Minerva's full name is Minerva Van Gogh, because they came to us missing half an ear. The quarter cup is... I have it, and then we know. Which means it's probably a dishwasher. Uh, yeah, the Van Gogh is a uh, pair of my mother and older brother, who we adopted them from. They were originally... Jefferson, or possibly just Thomas, I don't remember, because my older brother found them at the Thomas Jefferson rest stop at on the turnpike, the Jersey turnpike. Yeah, but who wants Thomas Jefferson in their house? <laughs> and then it was Van Gogh because of the ear. And then we got a hold of them, and we're nerds. Moderately soft dough that is smooth and elastic. Well, this isn't going to be super smooth because it's whole wheat flour, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm pretty sure challah isn't supposed to be made with whole wheat flour, but it's what we got, so whatever. We'll see how it goes. The yeast is in the fridge door. Sorry, I put it away. Autopilot. <sighs> but yes, uh... There's Minerva Van Gogh and there's Remy J. Foucault. And Remy came to us uh, also missing part of an ear and the tip of his tail and with not great function in one eye. He's, uh, he was a stray cat, clearly had already been in and lost a few, uh, a few fights. And now he's got like not great vision and not great balance. And sometimes he falls off the couch, but he's, he's, never like seriously hurt himself doing it. He just sometimes falls over and it's fine. Because he rolls over, he yeah. gets on his belly. And then he forgets that he's on the edge of a couch. And then we laugh at him because what's the point of having a cat if you do not have entertainment value? That's what I think. Usually whole wheat challah is made with half whole wheat and half white. I believe that. I wish we had white flour. <sighs> Okay, I have now been kneading this for seven minutes, more or less. I haven't been kneading it as thoroughly as I usually do, but it does seem to be uh, moderately soft, smooth, and elastic. So now it gets to go into a lightly greased bowl, if we have a bowl that can be lightly greased. Time to wash them out of the bowl. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, the metal one is clean. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Dough hook. This is the dough hook, right? Yep, that's the thing. The hook. Dough hook. Every single time you get the dough hook out and attach it to the mixer. You know what I think of? I think of. No. I think of a series of comic strips from the West Comic Akewood. Anybody remember that? Was that a newspaper? No, it was only webcomic. It was far too profane for the newspaper. Um, I need something to dry this with. Well, I'll just take it. Yeah. Is that the lowest? Uh, it's the second lowest. Go down to lowest. Like, give it some time. Yeah. Yeah, the comic strip Akewood 
sound off in chat if you've ever heard of this thing. It was a, a webcomic from like the olden days, the wild west of webcomics. Its heyday was the heyday of, I don't know, Mega Tokyo and when Penny Arcade was still relevant and crap like that. Gosh, um, Akewood was about a bunch of anthropomorphic animals um, having really exaggerated versions of people problems. And they had a cat character named Roast Beef. And Roast Beef the cat had chronic depression. And like it was it was a really good depiction of what depression is like. Uh, like it was very visceral and very, oh, this this person actually knows what it's like to just be sad a lot of the time. Um, and Roast Beef got married in a very nice storyline. And because Roast Beef has chronic depression, one of the things that happened when he got married was that uh, he specifically put like the cheapest versions of things on his wedding registry because he didn't want to get heirs and get, uh, you know, go above his station by getting nice fancy things for his wedding. So he got, they asked for a stand mixer for their wedding, but only the four cup kind, only the really small kind because anything bigger would just be, you know, above, it would just be asking too much of his very rich friends or whoever. So he asked for the four cup kind. And then there's like a series of comic strips in which his friends get increasingly mad because they're trying to buy the four cup kind off of the wedding registry at Sears or wherever. But the four cup kind doesn't come with a dough hook attachment and it's too small for the dough hook attachment and they want their friend to be able to make bread. And so there's like a set, an arc of comic strips that's just hilarious cats arguing with someone at Sears about stand mixers. No. What they did, or what one of them did at least, I remember, was that he got the four cup kind because it was on the registry and he gave it to them at their wedding and there was a note inside that said, you want my advice? Return it. Get the eight cup kind. It'll be better for you. Good luck with what you're doing. Now that was like a very, uh, an extreme caricature of a gruff dad character. So it was like the nicest thing that had come out of this character. It was him buying this thing for them and being like, go return this and get a better one. Is that like Yes. I was reading webcomics back then. The name sounds very vaguely familiar. It was definitely like in the general circle of webcomics. Uh, there was a span of time where it parodied other web comics or other web comics parodied it. XKCD parodied Eggwood amazingly. Here's that like grease. I agree. Yeah. Or at least lift it up so the spray gets under it. Bread is very important. Oh. Okay. All right. Alrighty. Flop it in, turn it once so that grease gets all over it. And start the oven on its lowest possible temperature just for rising things. This is my bread baking secret for this particular kitchen where everything is cold and the humidity is very difficult to control. So just put the you oven on. A lot of we, I just put the oven on 170 and let bread rise in there. It makes a huge difference. We, when we first moved into this apartment, it was April and winter was really just coming to an end. It snowed. It snowed the first weekend we were here. No. <laughs> but um, I don't know how long the apartment hadn't been lived in. But because the, uh, oh, this needs to be covered also. Yeah. I don't know where the saran wrap is. 
Can you put it back? I see you first. Oh, put it back. <laughs> um, anyway, there was, um, because the, the, the humidity here is so gigantic, enormous. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, while it was just turning into spring, there was so much condensation around the toilet in the bathroom that we thought it was leaking. <laughs> we would just constantly have a puddle in the bathroom of condensation. Like, all right. And it wasn't leaking. No. Because it did eventually stop. Yeah. Okay. Would this be like tight or no? Nah. It's on. Yeah, it is on to keep drafts away, which also putting it in the oven helps with that. But. Yep, and the oven has just heated, so I'm going to turn the oven off. Ooh. And now it is in a warm, dry spot, and it will be there for an hour. Alrighty. What if we made cookies again? That was on our list. Yeah. Like, I assumed you were going by. Yeah. yeah. Or we could do the beets. Well, the beets are going to take a while to process, right? Yeah, we should start with the beets. Put them on, and then we can do the beets. Because they need to boil. Right. Okay. Did that make sense? Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> After I thought about it for a second. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to wash the cutting board. Uh, you want to pull the beets out there in a paper bag in the potato cover. I can remember which way it opens. Which paper bag? Yeah, there they are. Are we gonna... Well, Eli went to the farm stand by the Asian market down in Massachusetts yesterday. And it's become common practice to just use paper bags for chunks of produce. It's actually required that you not use reusable bags in Massachusetts right now. Well, also we, yeah. uh, in, well, Vermont at least, or yeah. Brattleboro? I yeah. don't think it was a statewide thing. Um, just Brattleboro uh, banned single use plastic bags. Yeah. But even before that, our uh, vegetable CSA which is, uh, you know, you pay a chunk of money to the farm at the beginning of the year, and then you just get uh, hulls of vegetables every week or every other week, depending on what time of year, for the rest of the season. And depending on the farm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just get paper bags full of potatoes and garlic. It's lovely. I did our CSA pickup today, and we got nettles, which is one of my favorite things about spring up here. Is sauteed nettles. Yeah. Uh, no, I did not. I had heard of fiddleheads, but I had not actually eaten them until we got here. I heard of fiddleheads in a Stephen King book. <laughs> <laughs> um, was, uh, Maine. The girl who loved Tom Gordon, which was about a little girl who got, she was like 10 or 11. And she got separated from her family along the Long Trail, which is the big trail that goes up through. Does it start in Massachusetts? I don't know. But I don't it remember. must go through. Or well, does it just go through the Appalachian Mountains? I think it must. Yeah, so That's like it starts down in Virginia or West yeah. Virginia. And yeah. then it goes up through Vermont and through Maine. There's a Vermont beer named after it. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so she gets lost along. A section of the main trail, the trail that goes through Maine. <laughs> and then she ends up finding a bunch of fiddleheads. And that was the first time I had ever heard of them. Ooh, nettle wine. Ooh. We should look that up. Yeah, okay. Nettle wine. I'm gonna not only am I gonna look that up, I'm gonna pass that to Circle Mountain. Circle Mountain is the farm that we get them from. Oh. Would you add the other cutting board in uh quarter or eight please? The white one would do, I think. Okay. 
Yeah, I keep meaning to. Yes, please. Okay. I would love the recipe for nettle wine. I keep meaning to do to make limoncello also. Yeah. Because it's it's really simple. It's just um, it's the vodka, uh, lemon juice and lemon uh, rind zest. Yeah, zest, and then thyme. We never remember to do it. Yeah, let's see for vodka and interesting things. I wonder if we just like took all these beet shavings and steeped them in some vodka. Would it just make sweet beet vodka? Um, chunks that are, oh, right, because we're pickling them. Yeah. Should I do slices? Slices like would be that? lovely. Yeah, that size slice would be lovely. So I have been craving pickled beets. I, I need them in my life. But unfortunately, the first time I got pickled beets, I uh, did curbside pickup with the food co-op down here. So I just asked them for what they had. And what they had was this, like, healthy jar that was just... They were kind of weirdly funky. Yeah, they were bitter, like but also were, funky. They weren't bad. They were just not what you expect out of a pickled bean. So then I went to the supermarket the next time we had a supermarket run, and I got a jar of pickled beets. And they're Harvard beets, something else I never heard of. Uh, and they're, like, super sweet and packed in like a jelly. And it's gross. And that's not what I want when I want a pickle. I did have to point out, it does say in very, very fine print on the label that they are sweet and sour. <laughs> Which is a lie, because they're not sour at all. Perfect. I'm absolutely using these beet peels to steep vodka. I'm doing that. We have a million mason jars, why not? And also, like, these are farm stand beets, so I trust that after a good wash, they're not, like, poisoned or anything. Though also, it feels like any there's very little that a good soak in alcohol doesn't murder. So those are different things, right? Having a pesticide and having a, an organism. A chemical versus a pesticide, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are different things. Still, I trust farm stand beets. Oh, I have it in my pocket. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Metal wine. I'm excited. It sounds delightful. We're also both going to have beet hands. Yeah. That's what happens when you cook with the natural pigment. I come from a family that is extremely, like, iron deficient. Most of my family members, really. So uh, we've all, at some point or another, learned to sort of obey the cravings when the craving is like, I need this specific iron-rich food. It's like, okay, I will also take an iron pill and eat some chocolate and do whatever, but I'll also obey the actual craving and get my butt some beets. That is something you saying that I need stronger blood. That's the thing, right? More metallic blood. Yes. Blood is not iron rich enough. But when Magneto comes, take us all away. I was just going to say, I need to have <laughs> uh, an illicit bathroom trist, trist with, uh, with Mystique and get some more iron in my blood. <laughs> And if any of you got that reference. <laughs> say something about plastic rooms and sexually charged chess games. <laughs> I miss when Xavier and Magneto or Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. Those were the good days. <laughs> Mostly good days. Mostly good days. There were bad things about them, for sure. But 
<laughs> it must have your certain music on. Yeah. What are you laughing at? <clears throat> Alrighty. Here's a mason jar full of beet shavings. I washed them pretty well, but you know, they're root vegetables. There's always going to be some dirt in them. I'll strain it like three times when it's done steeping. But we also have some cheap vodka. Today really is the savory day. You don't want to use the Smirnoff raspberry? No, <laughs> I don't want the artificial raspberry flavor in my very real wholesome beet flavor. I might put some frozen raspberries in there in once our it's defense, done steeping. In our defense, we did not buy the Smirnoff. <laughs> but the fake raspberry ass candy Smirnoff can eat my ass. <laughs> no, my mom moved out of our our childhood home <laughs> where she lived for 35 years. And she had a lot of alcohol that people had bought her or that uh, my older brother bought that got used for a single uh, cocktail. cocktail yeah. And nobody really drank. So we just took a bunch of <laughs> alcohol Negative. and hit it in the trunk because a lot of it was open yeah <laughs> well we drove back it was fine we didn't get pulled over. <laughs> we didn't negative says they were very much in love with each other and that made up for the bad parts and that's exactly right and i agree completely ian mckellen and patrick stewart are the best anyway, there's nothing inherently wrong with spray <laughs> There's just something wrong with most flavored vodkas, especially most fruit flavored vodkas. It's just so sugar. Mm -hmm. It's so not even well, like good sugar. It's also like we don't drink vodka with like cocktails a lot. It's true. So it's usually just like a little bit to sip. Here we go. And then like a nice vodka. Yeah. And the LA like students. It's true. I am. Because they're a hometown baby. I I am kind of like loyal to Austin, Texas in a lot of ways. And Tito's Vodka is one of them. We do also have a local. Well, I think we have a couple of local Vermont vodkas. Yeah. Like, like one of them kind of tastes weird, and the other one is very good, but also very expensive. Yeah. Like the local distilleries are where we go for nice gin. Because they know exactly what they're doing with gin, and it's very much worth the price. Expensive, super expensive, fancy vodka. It's hard to justify the price because it's not. The whole point is, it, it doesn't taste like much. They're like also the whiskey. Yeah. We also have the people that make the whiskey. Yeah. But like the one that tastes, it. The one that tastes weird, like they use like anise or something in it. Yeah. And I just don't like anise. They licorice it up, and it's like, if I want licorice in my booze, that's what black sambuca is for. My <laughs> father-in-law taught me this, and and he's right. I still, <laughs> but, you know. If I want, like, a shot of still. licorice in my whole body, I get a little glass of black sambuca, and I'm good. I have plenty of things to relate to my father with, and, you know, it's nice for Eli to have them. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, Don't drink a rock. I, I will trust you on that. <laughs> is Arak, where is Arak from? I don't know. Is that, I have an Armenian friend who likes it. Is that where it's from? Or is that just, is that a connection that's just in my, in my head? Cookies? <laughs> Nab the cookie recipe. We don't need a lot of flour, right? <laughs> One and two thirds of a cup. Uh, I'm not sure we have a cup. Let me text our neighbors.
like this is probably maybe half a cup. Oh boy. Do you well, that? Too much flour. We should have checked before you went grocery shopping. Probably. Uh, mostly in East, Middle Eastern, so it makes it kind of citrus friendly. No, it tastes like very strong black licorice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not a black licorice. <laughs> One of the nice things about really good friends with being really good friends with our upstairs neighbors is when we run out of flour, I'll send a text and maybe they'll have it. Then I'll remember to wash my phone. Yeah, I've been experimenting with using, um, we have anise seeds on our spice shelf, spice rack. And I've been experimenting using it, like just a little bit of it in uh, tomato sauce, which is pretty good. Um, but it's a little bit. Yeah, it's just a little bit. It's like just a little to cut some of the acid. Listen, I love the flavor and I will freely admit that most things that use a piece use a crap ton of it. So it's just the only thing that you taste forever. This is also my problem with pineapple juice. Speaking of common cocktail. Yeah. I, I do believe that pineapple juice can be used to good effect in moderation. Absolutely, but, but it but so rarely is. Yeah. Most of the time it just takes over whatever you put in. And like, you may understand that you need to just put a little bit of it in. Otherwise the whole thing is just going to taste like pineapple juice. Yeah, this isn't quite the cup. <laughs> yeah. Upstairs might have some flour. And like upstairs is also, they get a lot of our baked goods. So sometimes they lend us flour and it's fine. They did get a whole lot of bread. It's true. I make a very good mulled wine with anise, but it's two pods with several other spices and yeah. apple juice. Ooh. I've had anise in cider, in mulled cider before also. And that feels like a good part of a, a well-rounded bouquet. Yeah. We haven't mulled wine in a while. Yeah. Do we have wine to mull or are we out because of the last round um, of sauce? We are out. Because okay. we haven't actually bought wine in a while. Yeah, we can do that. Well, we bought, we bought the nice local wine. <laughs> Which is not like we bought support your local businesses wine, which yeah, we are not going to mull because it is already just yeah. It's specific. Uh, it's the Puppy Mountain Winery, and they don't do like reds and whites and rosés. They do rhubarb and blueberry. Okay, right, we're going to need cream of tartar, baking soda, and more salt. That's cornstarch. Do we have baking soda? Yeah, it's already out. Yep. Lovely. Brown sugar. Um, What's in the other one? Powdered sugar. Oh, okay. It is marked with a P for powdered. Uh, very important for making icing back when I was attempting to perfect my Swiss meringue icing for cakes. Yeah, please do. Oh, it's just warm because it's, warm. it's May. <laughs> I once made mulled wine out of my uncle's homemade wine that he forced on everyone. It's a great way to use substandard wine. I agree completely. This is, let's get some cheap wine just so we can mull it and make it better. <sighs> Going to need an egg, vanilla extract, and loads of cinnamon again, and butter. A stick and a half. Whoa! It's May! Yeah, but now it's like summer? And let's do some spring. spring. Yes. Oh boy. We need an egg. Yay. Is, flour is there egg over there? Um, egg there are eggs, eggs, yes. Okay, good. All right. 
heavier. Some damage. Really? Some damage. It's supposed to go into the presence. Mm -hmm. Water feels better. Which I put in a salt bar journal piece. I might have melted tablespoons. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think We're I back. melted tablespoons of butter for you. Listen to what it was, right? I'm gonna check the mail. All right, you do that thing. Yeah. Internet cable. But sometimes I think it is. <sighs> we appear to have viewers. Anyway, yeah, our mailbox is one of those just like metal. Some